Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We'll go ahead and get started in just a few minutes. Hello. Hello. Hi, Seth. This is Ainsley. How are you? Hi, Ainsley. Oh, you can hear me. That's good news. This is like a James Bond movie for the last few minutes. <laughs> oh. I, 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 I got into a taxi cab and we hit a wall of traffic because somebody, some dignitaries in town and they shut down Madison Avenue. And I said to the driver, OK, if you're willing to go on the police lane, I will give you a very big tip. <laughs> so, so he did it. Oh, oh my, my God. God. I think I'm having a heart happy. attack. I think I'm having a heart attack. Yeah. So everyone's on the line right now and ready to go. So I'll just um, go ahead and introduce you and then hand it over to you. Okay, and do are the names alphabetically? It's Quasi Staff, Seth Siegel. Are there others on here as well? There are. They're under attendees. So you and I are the only ones that are going to be listed under staff. Okay, and should I? Is there an? Is there are people? Are there some people who are looking? Are there video? Does anybody have video? Nobody has video, right? Nobody has video. That's correct. Okay. So if you'd like to um, show your webcam, you're more than welcome. Or we can just keep it all audio. That's up to you. Okay, this is whatever you, I, I've never done this before, so whatever you want me to do. So I'm on phone call. Should I stay on that? Yeah, that's, that works fine. Okay, great. Okay, oh, you can open me up whenever you want then. All right, I'll go ahead. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's cyber seminar, Troubled Water. Today we are joined by Seth Siegel, who is an entrepreneur, lawyer, water activist, and a New York Times bestselling author recognized for his thought leadership and advocacy on water scarcity and quality. He is the author of the just released book, Troubled Water, What's Wrong with What We Drink? A Critical Look at America's Drinking Water. Seth is also the author of the award-winning international bestseller, Let There Be Water, Israel's Solution for a Water-Starved World. Seth is a senior fellow at the University of Wisconsin Center for Water Policy, and his commentary has appeared in many leading publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as on television and radio. 
He has spoken about water issues before hundreds of audiences around the world, including in Congress, the United Nations, and Google's headquarters, as well as dozens of universities, including Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. So on that note, I'll hand it off to our speaker, Seth Siegel. Thank you very much, Ainsley. Thank you, everybody, for uh, calling into this uh, call. Um, I am not, uh, I may be an unusual speaker for you in that I am not an academic, uh, but I have spent the last, say, call eight, nine years immersed in academic uh, studies and speaking with, uh, if not those of you on this call, many of your professional colleagues trying to master the subject matter. Um, I came to write this book as, a, as it really is an, almost as an accident um, because I had planned not only on writing what was my first book, I had never had a thought that I'd become a water writer uh, uh, as a career. Uh, I had a wonderful business and legal career, uh, left the law, started a business. That business ended up getting bought, and I devoted, decided to devote myself to public service. Uh, I had, when, I would been a, when I'd been an undergraduate, I had an academic advisor and uh, told him I, think I thought I wanted to go for a PhD and I'd pursue a career in academia. And he said, told me, I didn't realize he was talking more about himself. He told me I'd have a miserable life uh, <laughs> and I shouldn't do it. Um, as it turned out, I thought he was wrong. And, uh, and so when my business got sold, I decided to start immersing myself in an academic subject. And that was the area of water scarcity. That became the book, Let There Be Water, which I'll be glad to talk about during the Q&A if anybody has a question. But what happened was late in the process of, of doing the research for that book, I learned to my surprise that uh, drinking water was widely contaminated, not just uh, this is before Flint, Michigan, so Flint wasn't on my, in my thinking. Um, I assumed, I think like most Americans do, that uh, drinking water is pure and fine and safe always to drink. It never occurred to me that, uh, 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 never occurred to me that there were measuring tools that would educate us, mass spectrometers that would educate us about the fact of, of dangerous uh, or if not dangerous, certainly contaminants in our water with unknown dangers. Um, that led me to, um, again, not thinking yet I was gonna be writing a book, that led me just to be curious. And while I was on the road touring around uh, Let There Be Water, uh, I got tutored by a bunch of your colleagues who sent me lots of articles. I read lots of, lots of articles which are shown in our extended bibliography, which I can send to anybody who'd like on this call. It ended up being hundreds and hundreds of articles. Um, and as I learned more and more about this, I became more and more puzzled. I thought to myself, how is it possible in our advanced country that we could find ourselves in a situation that there's widespread contamination? And then along the way, while I was doing the writing, Flint, Michigan happened, and it struck me as not only not surprising, but commonsensical. And I thought, gosh, there must be lots of other places too. So I have lots to say. Um, I, I'll summarize uh, before we open this up. I'd like to bring this into a couple of areas. Uh, first, to talk about pricing. Second, to talk about, uh, about governance at the federal level, the regulatory agencies, and finally to talk about the executional piece at the utility level. We can talk about lots of other things like testing and uh, fraud in that testing and reporting and fraud in the reporting, but I, I, I think it's helpful to focus on fewer issues rather than more. So let me start by talking about pricing. Um, it, strike, it strikes me after doing some investigation uh, of a few years uh, that water pricing is, um, is counterproductive because what pricing does best is that it sends signals to the market of what people are prepared to do, what prepared people are not prepared to do, and that the widespread subsidies of drinking water <clears throat> lead to um, a problem because people are incentivized to waste water. Now, people, everyone gets, everyone, nearly everybody gets a water bill so they may mistakenly think that it's directly tied to not only their water usage, but also may mistakenly think it has something to do with what it costs to produce that water. And they may even assume that it has something to do with the getting that water to be pure, fine, safe uh, drinking water. But in fact, as we, as we actually know, is that pricing is rather arbitrarily stated and that it, we have it from two perspectives. First is that many mayors artificially keep prices uh, artificially low. And they do that because they know that their publics see pricing as a tax of some kind, and they don't wanna find themselves unpopular with their publics. So they keep water prices artificially low. That has a very, very dangerous long-term effect. Not only does it discourage conservation, but it also beggars the local utility from having the capacity to hire the very best, uh, most trained engineers. It, it keeps them from being able to buy the most up-to-date technology. And as a consequence of infrastructure, 
it incentivizes everybody to delay uh, replacement of critical infrastructure for as long as possible, even if that means just a gigantic amount of leaks in the drinking water system. So pricing on the one side is too cheap. On the other side, it sometimes is too expensive. And that is because of the fact that many mayors, uh, especially those in communities with shrinking uh, tax bases because uh, businesses have moved out or because population is falling or pr home prices for assessments are worth less, uh, what, as, what happens is sometimes mayors lead to charge too much for water. And uh, that is the case widespread around the country in, in uh, depressed communities where uh, water fees actually are not water fees. Water fees are a cover for uh, resource generation, for tax resource generation, and that pricing of, of, um, uh, of water fees has almost no relationship on the, now on the high side to the actual cost of doing everything. But because consumers are getting, uh, are, are getting very high and expensive water bills, they legitimately might assume that their water system has all the bells and whistles that they might need. But what they don't know is that their water fees aren't going for water. They're going for the mayor's office and the mayor's staff and, and the other activities of city hall <clears throat> or town hall, as the case may be. So the first argument I make is that we have to get pricing on a rational, real world basis and that no one should be allowed to take water fees and, and, and divert them for other purposes. The second area I talk about, I'd like to talk about, <clears throat> is the EPA itself. Now, I started my research with this book assuming, as I think most Americans do, that the EPA is kind of where the good guys in government are. They're looking out for the fish and the birds and the rivers and the streams, and they're looking out for our, our, our goodness, our health, our wellness. And, um, and like uh, many of you, I assumed that this varies from administration to administration. And again, I had written a good part of the book before Trump became president, before the EPA of uh, the present uh, uh, administration was in place. But um, what I discovered in my book, to my great surprise, was that it almost doesn't make a difference vis-a-vis -vis drinking water as to who is in the White House, who is in Congress. Because going back many, many years, going back to the mid-1990s, uh, there is only difference between the Democrats and the Republicans is rhetorical. Democrats may talk a, a bigger, bolder game than uh, than uh, Republicans do. Republicans may sound like they're more pro-business, and Democrats may talk a better game about uh, about caring for our drinking water. But the only way we really can evaluate the uh, what a, a, an elected official really cares about is the bills they introduce and the bills that they vote for. And in, that, in those terms, regardless of who was in the White House and who controlled Congress, nothing has changed from administration to administration year to year. And this is something of, of to my mind, of, of grave concern. The biggest concern about the EPA, though, is the fact that it is a, 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 a sleepy, moribund, slow-moving agency that does not take a aggressive tack in terms of regulating drinking water contaminants they have focused since the mid-1990s on cost containment and what they call cost-benefit analysis over the direction of a public health, pro-health orientation. And um, this can be fixed with, by congressional action, but it also can be fixed, as I argue in the book, by moving uh, drinking water responsibility from the EPA over to some other agency, most particularly health and human services. And I give us a couple of examples in the book that although there are more than 120,000 chemicals of different kinds, pharmaceutical products, industrial solvents, uh, uh, pesticides, herbicides, and what, what, what have you. In commerce in the United States, only a very, very few have ever been regulated by the EPA. Um, and now, while I'm not suggesting by any means that all 120,000 plus chemicals are dangerous or that all of them get into our drinking water, we know because of use of mass spectrometers and otherwise that lots and lots do. And as a result, we know that this is a cause of concern, that the EPA is going too slow, not looking. And in fact, by federal law, they are limited in how many chemicals they're allowed to test for in any five-year period. So Congress works against their interest in this regard. But the EPA, even within the confines of what it has the rights to do, it itself does very little. And, and the measurement of that is the fact that the last time any chemical Indeed, the last time any contaminant of any kind, chemical or otherwise, was regulated by the EPA was 23 years ago. 
And what I discovered in my research, and it's all in the book, uh, uh, Let There Be Water, uh, What's Wrong With What We Drink. And if anybody would like a copy, uh, I'll give my email address later. And please email me, and I'll be glad to get you a copy uh, as my gift. Um, what, what, ha what has happened is that, um, uh, that there is no incentive for the EPA to regulate more chemicals or, or anything because the fact that they are at the, at the whim of Congress and the whim of, of uh, the utilities that simply don't want to see more regulation. Again, this is a bipartisan phenomenon. So you have towns and communities where there's Democratic and states with Democratic governors and Democratic mayors who likewise are trying to watch cost containment and the attitude is let's have as little regulated as we can. Um, and so therefore uh, no one is pushing for more regulation and that the citizen groups are, are mostly um, um, not very well organized. They're mostly not very powerful and they um, don't really have a lot of sway at the, at the EPA. The result of this is that um, Although the EPA has the authority to regulate chemicals and other contaminants, they simply choose to not do so. Um, the final area I'd like to talk about uh, before I go on to some other areas is to talk about the utilities themselves. Um, many of you on this call may already be aware of this, but for those of you who are not, be prepared to be shocked. Um, a rational system would have us have, you know, for small states, maybe one utility for the whole state, for larger states, maybe three, four, five, six. Um, and indeed, maybe even not a utility per state. Maybe you could have a whole New England utility or, or you could have a, a whole regional utility. But what we have instead is a, a completely insane Tower of Babel system of over 50,000, the exact number is 51,535, 51,000 drinking water utilities in the United States which means that there are just too many to be regulated. There are too many to be looked over. There are too many to be guided and coaxed. And what happens is the states don't want to get into political arguments with the local utilities. The federal government, uh, it's an honor system under the Safe Drinking Water Act that the utilities have to report when they have violations of contaminants that are above a certain level or that they fail to report. They have to file a violation notice. But indeed nothing really happens in connection with that even sometimes when a utility uh, files year after year after year sometimes we have reports of arsenic at high levels or thms at high levels or other contaminants at high levels that go on for more than 10 years and the epa doesn't find the community uh, and that just lets it all go so that's a that's a very big problem uh, for public health because millions of Americans are drinking water that they probably aren't aware of the fact that it has serious contaminants in them that are contaminants that are not the kind that I'm arguing should be regulated, but that are already are regulated and don't have any um, uh, guidelines or controls over seeing it elevated uh, for communities that allow it to be elevated. Until it gets into the newspapers, until the media starts screaming about it, it, it's basically it's a non-issue, and uh, frankly, that's my great motivation in writing this book. Um, the royalties all go to charity, and my goal here is to raise awareness, uh, whether it's on campus, whether it's in your department, whether it's uh, at businesses or, or utilities that are interested in changing the way they do business, to try to create an awareness and a concern and a desire to change the way business is done. My solution is that we begin having consolidations of utilities. The way this best could be done is by demanding of utilities that they fix violations more promptly within a year of their being recorded, and that if they can't do so, then if, if, if they can't do so, then begin ca causing them hardship or de demanding of them that they partner or, or consolidate or merge with another local uh, utility. I said earlier that we have a problem because the, of underfunding, but the place where this underfunding comes to the fore is at the utility level itself. The smaller the utility, the less likely they will have anyone of a highly trained nature as an engineer, the less likely they will have contemporary uh, technology, the less likely they will be uh, adequately and consistently fixing uh, their uh, infrastructure. So this is a problem that can be fixed by both carrots and sticks. And I'm happy during the uh, conversation period that's going to follow in a few minutes to talk about what some of that might be as well. 
Um, now, some people sometimes ask me, well, what about poor people? What, what do we do about people in communities without a adequate funding uh, for drinking water? Well, uh, for them, uh, I believe that we have to have a humane, pro-social approach, just as we have food stamps, just as we have shelter uh, that's provided for indigent people, just as uh, we have clothing allowances for people in poor families. Likewise, we have to provide for people who are, don't have the means to pay for their water bills. But there is a large, large number, uh, more than more than 14 million last year, of, of households that are shut off, uh, people living in households shut off last year that end up finding themselves having to pay fines and reconnection fees. And it's a great hardship, and it takes a large percentage of household uh, income to do that. And just as we need to have higher water fees because most people can afford to pay more, uh, water and sewage currently is a fraction of the electricity bill. It's a smaller fraction of the cable bill. It's an even smaller fraction of the monthly phone bill. Um, everybody could be paying more, but those who can't afford to pay more should be subsidized or given free water altogether. I'd like to talk a few moments, if I can, about bottled water. I'd like to pursue bottled water from at least two perspectives, one policy and one science. From the policy point of view, I'd like to talk about this and say that um, what we have now is about one third of Americans identify themselves as exclusively, exclusively uh, drinking bottled water. They don't drink tap water at all. About another third, a little less, um, is in the category of frequently drinking bottled water, but not exclusively. 92% of those who drink bottled water say that they do so according to a Harris poll because of health or safety reasons. Now, it would be nice to think that people only drink bottled water because they love the taste of it, or they only do it because of convenience, but it turns out that about 60% of all bottled water is consumed in people's homes, which means that they're just a few steps away from the far cheaper tap water that they could get uh, by turning the spigot. What this means is, is that people have lost confidence in their drinking water, whether it's because of health or safety, in some cases, I suppose, taste, but they have, lost, say, they have lost confidence in their local water, which means they have lost confidence in their local governance. And therefore, we really need to um, uh, understand that when most people talk about bottled water, they complain about the vast, vast amount of plastic that is created from the, and there's a real number, from the 70 billion bottles of bottled water that are consumed every year. Um, and that only a, a fraction of those, about 20 something percent are recycled. So that most of it becomes trash. People talk about this as a solid waste problem, but indeed the real problem here is that, um, that it's, a, it's a statement about the failure of government. When I was, now oh, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, I don't believe anybody ever even heard of bottled water. And now it's the most successful consumer product uh, in the supermarket aisles. So, we can get rid of the trash problem by restoring confidence in drinking water. People don't need to spend as much as 300% more for bottled water than they spend for tap water. And, um, and this, is, this is a problem that can be solved. From the scientific point of view about bottled water, there's another concern. And that is that there's two parts to the bottled water. There's bottle and there's water. Under a quirk in federal law, if a bottle of water is filled and then sold initially in the same state, it is not subject to any federal regulation. If it is like Fiji or Dasani or Aquafina, which is shipped between interstate lines and bottled for that purpose, then it is subject to FDA review. Bottled water companies are allowed to have in small quantities up to 91 different contaminants in the drinking water, in the bottled water. Um, and it's a self-reporting system. It's an honor system. And, uh, and the FDA takes the word for these different companies that report this. But 70% of the bottled water sold in the United States is not subject to any oversight like this whatsoever. It's subject to state review, but very few states do any review at all. And therefore, the water that fills the bottle is universally, or I'm sorry, nearly universally in these small communities is basically just tap water, sometimes with ozonation sometimes with other treatment, but there's nothing that requires it and they can simply fill the bottle of water and, um, and sell it, whether to the local store, to the local gas station, or however they wanna sell it. Um, and this, this really is a, a, a public, if not a public health issue, it's certainly a consumer fraud issue. 
The other problem about the bottled water, as I said, it's bottled and it's water, is the bottle itself. Because of the fact that we have such a vast number of bottles, 70 billion, such a vast number of bottles that are uh, cre created every year, um, the feedstock, the petrochemical feedstock that's necessary to create so much plastic can't possibly come from a uniform source. So therefore, we can't speak of a uniform kind of chemical composition of the petrochemicals. Because of that, there's any one of many, many different hundreds of combinations of petrochemicals that can be getting into our water and uh, in our bottled water. And particularly when the bottled water is in a situation like sitting out on a, in a gas station uh, where it's out in the open, where it's for sale, where it's heated, or in a hot car in the summer, or in a warehouse that's hot, the uh, chemicals can leach from the plastic into the water with some proven uh, ill effects for fetuses, pregnant women, and young children in particular. So it's something that people default to bottled water thinking that they're getting something safer, healthier, better. But in fact, it's very likely to be a, a, um, uh, either the same as tap water or potentially in some cases even worse. So what do I want? Okay, what I want to have is I want to have people wake up to understanding that there's a problem here because every single time there has been a change in drinking water regulations going back to 1912, which is the first time of the first drinking water law in the United States. Every single time it has come about only because the public is agitated and says, we're not happy with whatever the it is. So of the 120,000 chemicals that are in commerce, some, some many of them that are getting into our water, we need to be testing them to see what effect it has on human health. Many of these are endocrine disrupting compounds and we need to be doing all that we can to make sure that whether it's the tap water or the bottled water, that what we're drinking is not contributing to one of a variety of health hazards. <clears throat> I'd like to close by talking about something that I find frightening, but which interestingly enough, every single scientist and professor whom I interviewed, when I said to them at the end of the interview, tell me what's the one issue that nobody is talking about that should be a concern. Every one of them gave the same answer without ever coordinating amongst themselves. And they said, we have to talk about pharmaceutical residue. So to the extent that you guys don't know, you guys and women on this call don't know about, um, about that issue, I'd like to explain to you what that t t issue is, and then, and then I'll stop and, and perhaps we can open this up for a conversation. The issue is that, um, that when wastewater treatment plants were created in the United States uh, about 100 years ago, they were, became very good at taking um, the material that we flushed down our toilets mostly and addressing that. Around 1950, we became a very medicalized society. And we now have a situation where of Americans 12 and over, 70%, 7-0, take one or more pharmaceutical products every day. And 20% take five or more every day. These are excreted into our toilets and then flushed into our uh, wastewater treatment plants, where unfortunately the bacteria that work on the material that we you know, normally think of uh, what they do, uh, does nothing in the main to degrade or change the profile of these chemicals. Then, as is legal under the uh, Clean Water Act, um, the utility, uh, the, the wastewater treatment plant can then dump the water in a lake or into a river, and the public is led to believe that, well, it's safe, it's been treated. But in fact, it is not adequately treated because these pharmaceutical residues remain. And then if you are downriver, if you were, in el uh, if you were elsewhere in the lake, you may think that the solution to pollution is dilution, that the vast amount of water protects you, but in fact, actually these contaminants come right back at you, at your neighbor. And since every one of these pharmaceutical products is a chemical that was designed to somehow or other change something in your body, it, if you're taking psychiatric medicine, it's to make you happier or slower or sadder or, or less manic. If you're schizophrenic, it changes your, your brain waves to some degree. It, um, it changes your endocrine system. If you're taking birth control pills, then it changes your, um, it changes your hormonal structure. If you're taking Lipitor or, or, or some other cholesterol drug, it changes how your body produces cholesterol. And I could keep going on and on and on. Every one of these drugs is designed to do something to your body. And that's good. That's great news. The, EP, the FDA tests all these drugs rigorously. And they want to make sure that the right drug at the right dose for the right duration 
will affect the right ailment for the right person. And that's wonderful. But what happens when very small doses of that same pharmaceutical product are taken by the wrong person or taken as a cocktail with three or four or five or 40 of different pharmaceutical products mixed together or what happens taken for the wrong duration or it's taken by a pregnant woman? What is the effect of all of this? And the answer is mostly we don't know because there isn't enough research being done. So no one on this call is going to be angry at me for saying that we need to have a much more robust scientific infrastructure. We need to be doing much more research. Um, and I call for that. I want to conclude with one final um, saying that uh, somebody that I interviewed used and that I've come to understand as being the truth. The public has been led to believe that our drinking water everywhere, except for an outlier like a flint, is just simply fine and safe. But what I've come to learn is that legal is the real definition of what people are talking about. It's legal, but legal doesn't equal safe. Legal means that this is a standard that's been created by the EPA or by a utility, and that we make the decision to re regulate con contaminants at a level that may or may not make sense scientifically, but make great sense politically. And I'll take one example um, about this legal safe uh, duopoly here. And that is that dichotomy here. And that is that um, we know, for example, that probably the right uh, level of arsenic is three parts per billion. Some say four, some say five, but nobody thinks that anything above five is the right number. And yet the federal government during the Clinton administration regulated arsenic at 10 parts per billion. So I was curious as to how that happened. So I looked into this and what I discovered was that it was not a scientific decision as to how to protect us, but a political decision. What was the number, what was the concentration of arsenic that would agitate the fewest number of utilities and get the fewest number of congressmen and the fewest number of governors calling to complain? And what they determined was that above 10 parts per billion, you had a relatively smaller number of utilities that would be complaining. That would mean a fewer number of congressmen would be getting angry phone calls. But instead, if you went down to five parts per billion or three parts per billion, the vet number would grow vastly. And so the person in the Clinton administration who spoke anonymously about this said to me, we couldn't take the heat with a lower number. Whether the right number is lower would be better for and more protective of public health. He said to me, I'm not sure. I'll take the fact that we got the right number, but that what I know is politically nothing lower than 10 could have been sold. And I don't think that that's how our drinking water should be handled. We should have a pro-health, public health orientation and cost benefit analysis should be secondary to what's best for the nation's health. So I'll stop here. We've spoken for a long time as a monologue and I apologize if I've droned on for too much. I'd love to open it up. Ainsley, if you could open the lines and have anybody who has a comment or a question, I welcome both. Um, I, I'm still on my journey. I'm, I'm speaking widely. This is my third time today speaking about this issue. I have one more after you guys, and, and I use guys generically. That's not a gender-specific phrase. Um, and um, I'm trying to raise awareness of this issue. Um, my book is a vehicle for raising that awareness, but it's not uh, an essential piece. Oh, I said earlier that I'll give you my email address. My email is Seth. S E T H at Seth M Siegel, S I E G E L dot com. Um, please reach out if you'd like a free copy of the book. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Seth M Siegel. And Ainsley, open it up now, please. Great. Thank you so much, Seth. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute all of you on the line um, so we can open it up for a conversation. So if you have any questions, please feel free to speak up or you can type your questions in the chat box. Yeah, I think we have plenty of time too. Do we have any questions so far? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah, no, he's, he's nice. He's for about that. Okay, again, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to speak up or type your questions in. That's good news. I like to hear that. Yes. Yeah. So Seth, um, I'm not sure if we have any questions. Nothing's coming through on my end and I'm not having anyone speaking up as of right now. I think that might conclude our, or I see one coming through here. Yes, um, Samantha Pond, or actually let's start with um, Ross Andrew, asks, do you have any idea about what the match slash mismatch between the 50,000 plus utilities and population numbers are within the country? Beth, are you still there? Hello, hello. Hi, sorry, you. I think you were muted. Did you hear the question that I asked? Yeah, yeah. oh, oh, you know, I've been answering it. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I no. guess I was muted. <laughs> sorry, yeah, oh. we can and hear was, you now. And, and it was genius what I said. Let's see if I can recreate it. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, yeah, sorry about that, everybody. So, um, well, once again, by the way, I'd like to just make sure, I don't know if you heard when I gave my email address, Seth, because my name is misspelled in the invitation. So it's Seth at sethmsegel.com and Siegel's S-I-E-G-E-L. If anybody would like a free copy of the book, please let me know. If anybody would like me to do a Skype class, um, uh, again, be delighted to do that. I've done many of them on sp both specific topics and general topics. Uh, glad to do that with you. Uh, in, term in, terms of, um, in terms of the uh, population piece about uh, utilities, is that the, about 47,000 of the utilities are, uh, cover uh, networks of 10,000 people or fewer. So of, of the 51,535, uh, obviously the vast bulk are in small population centers. And in fact, you only need to have, um, uh, you know, a, 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 you could have a trailer park, could have it be its own water utility. Um, you could have a, a, so when I started this, I thought maybe it's just really rural America, you know, places in North Dakota and Montana are these really small utilities. But it turns out that's not even close to the case. Um, Los Angeles County, just one county in California, has 200 water utilities. The state of California, a highly populated state, has 7,500 utilities. So that there's no, so that what you, but what you do discover, and I talk about this in my book at some length, what you do discover is that violations of the Safe Drinking Water Act come um, uh, at high velocity, the smaller your utility. Now, again, this is a self-reporting system, so one would have to believe that the number of violations is far higher than the 80,000 violations that are reported every year. But, but even assuming it's exactly the right number and that there's no you know, monkey business, no fraud involved in underreporting, um, what, what you discover is the smaller the utility, the more likelihood of, of a violation. And which is not to say that large utilities don't ever get violations or very small ones sometimes go years without a single bona fide violation. But that, but that one of the most uh, clearest ways that we could be protective of public. One of the clearest ways of, of public, of protecting public health 
I think I keep getting un, uh, muted and unmuted, but I, I'm not sure I keep hearing something here. Uh, but one of the clearest ways of being, of being protective of public health would be to reduce the number of utilities uh, so that they could have a larger uh, cash flow and a larger uh, a base of uh, staff that could be helpful to to their uh, uh, to their uh, uh, consumers. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another couple or another question actually um, come in from Samantha Pond. She's asking, what organization would you give the water regulation to rather than the EPA if you had a choice? Okay, so I write about this in my book. Um, I, I, I think that it was a historic mistake for Congress to assign drinking water to the EPA. And I, I, I'll, I'll give you the quick answer to your question, but then I'll, I'll want to give you some context. Um, the, the correct answer, I believe, is it should be in Health and Human Services. Um, but, but the real problem ultimately is, is that the Office of Management and Budget calls all the shots. This became absolutely crystal clear to me in my research and so speaking to people involved in why certain decisions were made. And the answer is that OMB, regardless of the president, the Office of Management and Budget is always looking to reduce the costs of, of compliance. And, and so, so, so that's what happened. But, but the reason why I think it's a historic mistake is that what happens is in 1970, the EPA gets created. Um, in 1972, and by the way, in 1970, 1970, 71, the first version of the Safe Drinking Water Act is introduced into Congress, and it doesn't get out of committee again in 73 and again in early 74. It never gets out of committee. And we learned something from this story in a moment. I'll explain what happens. In the meanwhile, in 1972, the, uh, the uh, Clean Water Act is passed, which des describes what, how factories, feedlots, and wastewater treatment plants shall discharge um, their, uh, their wastewaters. Um, and that made sense for that to be under the purview of the EPA. And there's a permit system that's created that everybody can, can discharge, but they need a permit to discharge. And therefore, they have to report on what's being discharged into the water. And that made perfect sense for that to be an EPA choice. Then two years later, suddenly there's this national health scare. And why this is relevant is this is how we tend to change water, drinking water policy in America. There's a scare. And the scare here was that it was discovered that chlorine, which is supposed to make water safe for everybody, it was discovered that chlorine, when mixed with organic material like dead leaves that fall into water or, or dead bugs that fall into water, that when organic material and chlorine mix, trihalomethanes um, start to uh, be created. And at that time in 74, it was believed that it was a carcinogen. Now it's a confirmed carcinogen. Um, and it was reported in the nightly news. It became a national phenomenon. And in a matter of weeks, it comes, uh, Safe Drinking Water Act is reported out of committee. It's on the floor of, uh, of, of uh, both houses of Congress. It's passed by large majorities after it couldn't even get out of committee. And Gerald Ford signs it into law the same day it comes, gets sent over to him. Um, but what happened was they just sort of casually said, oh, well, the Clean Water Act is under EPA. So the Safe Drinking Water Act should be as well. And frankly, that, that was a mistake. It should never have been in any agency that was focused on anything other than public health. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, we have a few more coming in. Um, uh, Steve Bergs asks, what is the incremental cost of attaining five PPB for, um, I'm assuming this is A's or AS? AS? Could you, read, could you read the question one more time? Sorry. Sure. Uh, what is the incremental cost of attaining five PPB for, I'm assuming that's either AS or AS or A's? Um, five, oh, oh, for, oh, for arsenic, you probably means. What's the incremental cost? Um, oh, yep. Yeah, um, uh, to get to five parts per billion. Okay. So the, the answer is, I, I, I don't know because I don't have, I, I wasn't able to get my hands on the data that would tell me that on a community by community basis. And that's a very valid question and something that I think we should, and maybe maybe one or two or three of you on this call would like to work with me on developing something. And since I'm not an academic, it would be my first academic uh, real paper that I've been involved with. But, um, but in any event, even without me, I, I urge you to do this. But here's what I do want you to know. And, and, and while I've painted kind of a bleak picture of bad governance and bad contaminants with unknown effects on our endocrine systems, on the health of our, of our children, our fetuses, and our elderly. The good news is, 
and, and the price is quite cheap. The good news is that Orange County, California has figured out a way to treat all of their water to a ultra high pure level such that all the contaminants are removed. They use microfiltration and reverse osmosis and ozonation and ultraviolet and, you know, and, and other techniques as well. And they, and, and, and they add into all of that a process for trying to keep the salinization of their water because they're along seacoast there as well. And with all of that, they report that it comes to 63 cents per person per week additional to what the cost was before they began this process. So that means for about 30 odd dollars a year per person, you could get water that's safe and clean and, and not a threat to whether it's a cancer threat or an endocrine disrupting threat. And, um, and I think that I'm, I'm, guided by, I'm guided by that. Now they also say that if they didn't have the salination, sal salinization problem with the seawater, the cost would be even lower. So it'd be maybe $20 a year a person. In their case, it's actually even cheaper because they get some state and federal subsidies. But I figured, to be honest about it, I, I stripped out all the subsidies and I reported it with, um, with as if the subsidies didn't exist. And, and without subsidies, it comes to about 63 cents. Now, some people say that um, uh, 63 cents a week per person. Now, some people say, well, 63 cents, you know, the, there are poor people in America. They can't afford that. And that's probably is true. But the number of people who are so poor in America, they couldn't afford $30 a year more. I don't know what that number is, but I know that there's a lot, a lot of people with cell phones and a lot of people with cable TV. And uh, that generally, uh, and there's an economist whose work I relied on for the book, that generally is at least five times larger than uh, water bills are right now. Water and sewage combined together, water bills are right now. So uh, it seems to me that this is something that's certainly affordable. Thank you. Uh, so this next one comes from Andy O'Reilly. Uh, what do you think is the most effective way for scientists or engineers to raise awareness and inform the public about this issue? Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I, I think that there's a, a bunch of, of steps here. I think that we need to elevate the conversation about water and make this into an everyday conversation. We talk about climate change, and we should. It's an important issue. We talk about climate change endlessly. There's hardly a, a fifth grader who doesn't know what climate change is about. But in, in, my, in my wanderings, I've discovered that really a very, very few people know anything about water issues. And that's why on a daily basis in your newspaper, there's articles about the energy industry. There's articles about climate change. There's rarely, if ever, an article about water unless it's about a, a, a water main break somewhere in your town. Our public officials mostly don't know anything about water issues, and I've interviewed loads of senators and congressmen and some mayors. They mostly know nothing about this issue. And the reason they know nothing about it is because no one has to ask them about this. I wrote my book to be an introduction for people to be more, become more aware of it. And, and, and I hope and pray that there'll be yet other books, maybe by people on this call, that will introduce other people to other facets of, of this problem. But the first thing is to raise awareness. And as people know more, they will demand more. So whether that is in your classroom, whether that is having uh, uh, seminars, whether that is having special conferences, wherever you go, say, I want to have a conversation. We talk about climate change. We talk about plastic. I want to talk about drinking water uh, contaminants. I want to talk about pharmaceutical residue in my drinking water because people don't know about these issues. And when they do, they will demand a change. And unlike the plastic problem, unlike the climate change problem, unlike other problems that plague our society, like race relations, this is a problem that we know can be solved with existing technology at an existing price. This is about raising awareness, write op-eds, write letters to the editor, talk to your students, talk to your grad students, talk to your fellow colleagues. Anybody who wants a copy of my book, as I've said, I'm glad to send you a free copy. Likewise for your colleagues, just tell me how we can be helpful in helping to raise awareness and we will, we will do all that we can do. I will also Great, say you, that although I, ha I just want to say uh, that although I haven't started sure. it yet, my plan is to start a, a, a not-for-profit organization. Right now, I'm a one-man band uh, running mm -hmm. around doing three, four, five of these a day. Um, I've, I've, I've recruited two very, very well-known people from the, the um, I call it the environmental community, uh, who were very turned on by what I'm trying to do with this book. And they're both preparing to leave their very well-known, highly regarded um, environmental NGOs to join me probably in February to start a new organization, which will be focused on, on PR around this topic for the news media and for other interested parties. Well, that's great news. 
Um, and moving forward with the questions, uh, in the essence of time, we have probably time for three more, I'd say. Um, okay. So we'll move on with the next one from Richard Brereton is asking, what are some of the emerging technologies that might help make drinking water safer? Oh, wonderful question. Okay, so it depends on what scale you're talking about. At the home scale, there's a whole bunch of uh, ever cheaper um, microfiltration, reverse osmosis systems for the whole house. There's also all kinds of new and wonderful technologies that are on the faucet or under the sink technologies that can help filter. But I prefer to have a s systemic uh, approach. And, and um, we, we know that, uh, as again, from the Orange County example, which I spoke about earlier, we know that we don't need to have lots of new technologies. We can use and, and deploy lots of existing technologies. We don't have to invent a, a new rocket to the moon. We already have that rocket that exists in these different technologies that I talk about in the chapter about Orange County. In addition, <clears throat> I'm happy to say, some of you may be familiar with companies like Xylem or Evoqua or Pan Pantair or Kohler or other companies that are in this space. And I've spoken with all of them and every single one of them has a very robust R&D department to be addressing these problems. In the interest of time, I won't go into this, but if the person who asked that question uh, is interested in knowing more, please email me and we'll make a personal connection and I'll, I'll follow up with you and, and put you in touch with this, this, the chief technology officer at one or more of these companies. Perfect. Uh, this next question comes from Yolanda McDonald. She's asking, while the EPA has direct oversight of the SDWA, the majority of states through prim primacy have real oversight, given that would you still recommend HRSA? Yeah. So thank you. That's a wonderful question. And frankly, I, I gave it short shrift in my intro. It's not that I'm not aware of it or that I don't talk about it in my book, but I gave it short shrift in my remarks because I wanted to focus on the EPA and the utilities and I didn't talk about the state level at all. So I'll just do it quickly here. Here's the, is that Yolanda? Is that the name? Uh, That's correct. The, the, yeah. Yolanda, the problem with the, the primacy is that it's a fraud. Not an intentional fraud, maybe, but it's a fraud. What happens is 85% of utilities are, are uh, public utilities. 15% are, are uh, owned by industry, investor-owned utilities. For those 85% of utilities, states do not want to get into fistfights with local uh, municipalities or local water uh, systems. And so what happens is, although they have primacy, although they could be doing something, they mostly do nothing. States are subject to the same budget constraints, and their attitude is, hey, we think of ourselves as a pass-through to aggregate data from the different utilities, to compile it slowly, by the way, too slowly, and then to send it on to the feds. Why in this day and age of advanced computers, <laughs> we couldn't have everybody in real time reporting everything so that everyone from the EPA to local bloggers could know what's going on in their water. I don't know why. I don't even know what role the state primarily has to play anymore. But in a time when the Safe Drinking Water Act was created, it made perfect sense, 1974, it made perfect sense that somebody had to compile the data and send it on. But now all it is is a, is, a, is a massive speed bump that slows down the process for the feds to find out that there's a problem, as if, by the way, the feds would even do anything to fix the problem. But, but in any event, if it was Health and Human Services or some other pro-health organization handling this, then you could assume that it could be done faster than the system it has right now. For me, myself, I would get... I would get the states out of the middle of this, and I would, I would, I mean, I'm not opposed to federalism, but I would, I would get the states out of this as much as possible. Great, thank you. Um, so we have one final question from Samantha Pond. She's asking, how could we regulate the pharmaceutical residue that is in the water? Okay, great, wonderful. So the best way, there are two ways to do this. Um, the better way to do it is, um, and I talk about this at, at great length in my book, the better way to do this is when it's in its most concentrated form, it's cheapest and easiest to take out a contaminant before it gets diffused. And so what I would, uh, what I argue in the book is a few things. First of all, is I'm not, uh, one of the scientists I interviewed who I quote in the book talked about with a slightly science fiction approach, which is let's demand of the pharmaceutical pr companies that they create pharmaceutical products that after they, you know, get into wastewater treatment, that they all basically evaporate and that their, their active ingredients disappear. Okay. It's a nice idea. And when it happens, hallelujah. Um, 
and I'm not cynical about it. It's just it's just not happening tomorrow. So what what we can do is we can do a few things. First is at our wastewater treatment plant, there's no reason why we still have to be using technology that's 50, 75, and older in terms of the, the types of technology being used. We have the capacity to take these contaminants out of the water at that stage before it gets uh, under the Clean Water Act, before it gets put into lakes and rivers, and we simply should be doing this. It's not healthy for our environment. It's not healthy for us. Not only does this boomerang back to us, but I didn't talk about this. There was a study done. I don't think I talked about this. There was a study done uh, about uh, about uh, psychiatric medications that, um, if I did talk about this, stop me, Ainsley, the psychiatric medications that one, one uh, scientist wanted to test to see how, um, how much psychiatric medication escapes from, um, uh, from wastewater treatment plants. So she tested the Great Lakes. She pulled several hundred fish out of the Great Lakes, and she found Celexa and Zoloft and 14 other psychiatric medications, which could only be coming through wastewater treatment plants. She, and 50% and of the fish, 50, 50% of the fish had Celexa or Zoloft in their muscle, their brains, their organs, the very stuff that we eat, by the way. But that's not why it's relevant, not because of the health issue. Uh, so, so we could be doing much, much more at the at the um, outbound side uh, for that. The other solution that I speak to, which is although the use of pharmaceuticals is widely diffuse, there are some places in every community that are intensive uh, centers of of pharmaceutical products, intensive. And if you can't fix it and make everything better, at least you can make it a lot better or somewhat better. Every single hospital should be required. To have water treatment as uh, before they put their water into the, the municipal water system, wa municipal wastewater system. Every hospital, because hospitals are a center of antibiotics, a center of chemotherapy and uh, contrast media, and lots and lots of other medications. Nearly every patient in a hospital has something in their system that they're peeing out, and that is getting into our, uh, our water. Plus, you know, all the antibiotics that are used, plus all the all the solvents that are used to wash the floors and clean the surgical centers. All, every hospital should have that. Likewise, every hospice should do the same because every hospice we now know basically is in the business of medicating with all kinds of uh, narcotics, medicating their patients. We're talking about millions and millions of patients every year. I talk about this at length in my book and it would make great sense for us to require of these two uh, facilities to to uh, to uh, to treat their water in the same way that feedlots, uh, municipalities, and corp and uh, factories have to do before they can discharge. Um, it, it's I, I interviewed the, one of the great historians of the Clean Water Act, uh, uh, Paul Malazzo, and and um, he said that at the time of at the time of uh, at the time of the Clean Water Act from 1970 to 1972, nobody even ever raised the question about hospitals because at that time the the concept of pharmaceutical residue wasn't a concern. It's a concern now, and we could be fixing that problem in, in the macro sense or the micro sense. So I just want to say it one final time, um, if anybody would like a copy of the book, Seth at Seth M. Siegel or Ainsley can put you in touch with me. Um, uh, follow me on Twitter if, you, if it's easier for you, Seth M. at Seth M. Siegel. Uh, again, that's at Seth M. Siegel. And, and truly, I'm, if, I can, if, if you're moved by any of this and you'd like me to speak to students or other faculty members, this is my life now. This is what I am doing. I am trying to raise awareness. I want to see better, healthier, healthier, safer drinking water, not in 20 years or 40 years, but in the next few years. It's doable. It's possible. And there aren't a lot of challenges we have that we can say that about. And everyone on this call can play a part. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Seth. And um, we really appreciate you uh, joining us today and you know, to get this conversation going. So it's been very interesting but, and insightful. By, by the way, I want to say for those of you, likewise, I had a very exciting PR moment this morning. Um, uh, David Leonhardt, the, uh, the op-ed uh, columnist of the New York Times, uh, wrote a piece yeah. about my new book. And maybe Ainsley, for those who are on the call, maybe if I could beg you, you could maybe distribute it to them as well. Sure, of course. We'd Thank be you. more than happy to. Yeah. Thank you so much again, and we thank everyone for joining us today, and um, we hope to speak with you soon. I hope so, too. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.